Good afternoon. I call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices remain closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of staff and students. This evening's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through live stream on bcps.org, as well as on Xfinity, Comcast Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all the voting items this evening will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable or when requesting discussion on an agenda item. May I have a motion to go into closed session as permitted by the Opens Meetings Act as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland, Section 3-305, B1 and B9, to one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance, evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. May I have a motion? So moved, Hen. Thank you, is there a second? Second, Ms. Pasteur. Thank you, may I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Mr. McMillian? Yes, thank you. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Ms. Scott? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Causey, there are nine board members present. Thank you, and with that, we have a quorum. Can staff let me know when the meeting Baltimore County for June 23rd, 2020. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence to, in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. In accordance with the mandated direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools remain and offices remain closed to the public and are only open for essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education resolution on March 10, 2020, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate without being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on bcps.org and also on BCPS TV through Comcast Xfinity Channel 73 and Verizon Fios Channel 34. 
In order to efficiently conduct the meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. The first item is consideration of the agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am not aware of any changes or additions to tonight's agenda. Thank you, Dr. This Williams. Is, this is Cosby. This is Rob McMillian. I'd like to make a motion. Certainly, go ahead. I move that we add the stop arms contract to tonight's agenda. Is there a second to Mr. McMillian's motion? Second, Molly. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Mr. McMillian, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, I have a couple comments to make real quick. Number one, there's zero cost to BCPS. We managed the contract. Number two, the county council voted six to one to approve legislation to allow BCPS to enter into a contract. There's four surrounding counties, Montgomery, Prince George's, Howard and, Howard, and most recently, Carroll County, that have entered into agreements with Bus Patrol, this particular company. Obviously, these county governments have vetted the company, uh, so it appears that the gaps in the original document, the original agreement with Montgomery County have been fixed, and we as a board received several documents that, that affirm that. There's cameras to be installed inside and outside the bus by bus patrol technicians. This frees up Baltimore County uh, employees from doing that. The financial split from the fine revenue is 60-40 in favor of bus patrol receives 60% with, uh, and this is an industry accepted standard. Along with the cameras, there's tablets that go along with every bus that helps with the pre and post inspections. Uh, number six on my list, last year, BCPS issued 71 tickets for driving through uh, the swing arms or driving past the swing arms. Bus Patrol, the company that's uh, assuming all of the financial risk in this project, uh, projects 225 to 230 tickets a day from driving through or past the stop arms. That tells me that this is a much bigger problem than we are aware of. 71 tickets all of last year as compared to their projections, which is 225 to 230 a day. And this is about student safety inside and outside the bus. The cameras are installed inside the bus, so there's going to be additional eyes being able to watch the students as they travel back and forth. And something I overlooked, there is a monthly finance report that bus, re bus patrol uh, gives back to us, talks about that how many tickets were issued, how many tickets were paid, and where that money is, where it goes, and how it's divided. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, are there, is there a board member comment on adding this item to agenda, not, uh, yes, not at this there. point in the meeting evaluating the merits of the contract, at this point in the meeting we're evaluating whether to add it to tonight's agenda for Madam yes. Chair? Yes. Yes, this contract has not been evaluated by the Building and Contract Committee, so I will not be supporting adding it to the full board meeting until it has gone through the Building and Contract Committee. Yes. Point of order, Ms. Causey. Can we vote on the motion to add it to the agenda before discussing the merits? Uh, also, Dr. Williams, do you have staff on hand to discuss the contract just to be brought last time to the full board. Thank you, Ms. Joes. The um, first of all, if I can ask people to mute that are not speaking, there's quite a bit of background noise. Thank you. Thank you for that. So what we are voting on is uh, policy 8314. There needs to be a majority vote of the board to add or remove an item from the agenda. So at this point, the uh, discussion is as to should we add it to the agenda. So um, we've heard from Mr. McMillian, Ms. Joes, and Ms. Hen. Are there other board members uh, that have discussion Ms. related Cosby. to whether to add this? Yes. Uh, this is Ms. Rowe. Yes. Um, I, I agree with Ms. Hen that this needs to be fully vetted in the Buildings and Contracts Committee, and I don't think that it should be added to tonight's agenda. Um, Ms. Quasi, this is Ms. Pasteur. 
I yes. would um, like to do, uh, have it added because I um, was remiss or recalcitrant in my vote um, when I just agreed. I should have asked why it was being removed. So uh, pass or fail, I would like to know exactly why it's being removed. So yes, I agree with Mr. McWilliams. Madam Chair? Yes. This is Ms. Hen. The Building and Contracts Committee received information just a couple of hours before the last committee meeting, and the committee did not have a chance to review that information before the last meeting. The committee plans to review that information for discussion at our next meeting, and then we will bring the contract to the full board um, with or without a recommendation at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will just say for myself that there was quite a lot of information that Mr. McMillian uh, stated to us, but I have in fact not reviewed uh, those documents. There's, uh, as I understand, quite a number of documents related to this. As Ms. Hen said, there were documents received um, just previous to the prior Buildings and Contracts Committee. So if this came to uh, a vote, I would not be voting for this contract at this time. Um, so I won't be putting that to the agenda. Other board members ha that have not spoken that would like to discuss this before I call a vote? Mrs. Causey, I'd like to say something, one last point. Can we just check if there's anyone else that has not yet spoken? Uh, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, Mr. McMillian. The documents that were submitted to us a couple hours prior to that meeting have been shared with the entire Board of Education probably two weeks ago. Uh, so people have had the opportunity yes. to look at those documents if, if they've had the time and the, the interest in doing that. So I just want to point out, it's been over two weeks since we've had those documents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. And I would just uh, state that since it was not on the agenda for this evening, and as there are several large items on the agenda, the operating budget, the five master agreement, uh, five master agreements um, that board members may not have read it. And I'm saying that I certainly have not read it. So um, any other discussion before I call for the vote of whether to add this to the agenda? Okay, may I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Pashore? Yes. Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Joes? Yes. Mr. McWilliams? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. I can't hear you. Ms. Mack? Mac, did you say no? I said no. Thank you, ma'am. Miss Rowe? No. Dr. Hager? This is Mr. Offerman. Yes. Uh, Mr. Offerman, thank you. Yes. Dr. Hager? Oh, yeah. I cannot hear Dr. Hager. Can someone mute, please? Dr. Hager? Ms. Causey, I, I cannot hear you. Dr. Hager. Is Dr. Hager still on the call? Yes, she is. Dr. Hager? I am going to need to call in. Dr. Hager, we are not able to hear you. Uh, I think Dr. Hager is um, having trouble getting unmuted. She's calling back in. Okay, you thank like you. We'll wait, Ms. Causey? Yes, if she's trying to call in, we will wait. Thank you. Ms. Tiffler, I, I, this is Molly. I believe Mr. Offerman joined in if you want to take his vote. Yes, he did, and he voted um, in favor, Ms. Joes. Thank you. 
Oh, sorry. I didn't hear that. Apology. Joining the meeting. This is Aaron Hager. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Hager, I can hear you. I'm so sorry about that. I was unable to unmute through Teams. Um, I actually, I vote no to add it to the agenda. No. So, Ms. Stifler, the final vote is? Seven in favor, five opposed. I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Hager is a no. That is correct. So it's seven in favor, five opposed. I believe it's six and six. I believe that's correct, Mrs. Causey. I would like to go through the vote again, if you're okay with that, Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Joes? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes, please. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? No. Dr. Hager? No. The vote is six to six, Ms. Causey. Thank you. The motion does not carry. Um, hearing no other additions or changes to tonight's agenda, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this um, evening, the board me, met Scott. in closed session. Yes? Excuse me. Hi, this is Ms. Scott. Yes. Um, uh, point of order. Um, I would like to make a motion that we limit debate tonight to two minutes per member, um, one minute for follow-up questions, and um, without the yielding of time to another member. Um, that, uh, I'm going to, um, ask Mr. Nussbaum, number one, I don't think that this is the proper time to hear that. And then to ask Mr. Nussbaum, um, what would the process be to, uh, limit debate in a matter that is, um, uh, in a manner that is inconsistent with our board practice. I'll ask Ms. Um, Howie to chime in too, but I believe it is appropriate to, to make a motion to limit um, debate. I'm looking at it right now. It is, must be second, it is debatable, uh, but it does require two thirds uh, for adoption. What okay, I'm looking at, Ms. Ms. Uh, Howie may want to weigh in, please. No. You're accurate, Miss. That's accurate, Mr. Nussbaum. Okay. Make up stuff. And is it um, consistent to do that at the beginning of the meeting when we're voting on hearing the agenda, or can we address that as a separate item next? Well, the, the agenda has been adopted, so I, th that's not on. I, I think so. I'm not sure that that's on the floor. Okay. Thank you. It was just the timing of when um, she was yeah. chiming in. Okay, so the agenda is approved as presented. And Ms. Scott, restate your motion, please. Yes, um, I make a motion that um, for tonight's meeting, um, I move that we limit debate to two minutes per member and um, one minute for follow-up question, questions without the yielding of time uh, to another member. Ms. Second. Scott, I'm going to ask a clarifying question. Oh. I'm sorry, did someone, did someone speak? Yes, this is Ms. Joe's second. Thank you, Ms. Joe's. There's been a motion and a second 
Ms. Scott, can you please, uh, would you like to speak to your motion and then we'll have discussion? Oh yes, certainly. Um, I just know that we have a lot of important uh, items to discuss. And so I think that that would be an adequate amount of time per member to um, basically um, discuss um, each item so that it's, um, everyone has a chance to speak and has an adequate amount of time to speak. Board members, discussion? Um, this is uh, this is Molly. Andy, this is a point of clarification I need from, from you. This is debatable for Robert's rule. She's just asking for, uh, and Ms. Howie, please feel free to weigh in as well. I, I don't believe this is debatable. She's just asking for a motion to limit debate. It is debatable. Okay. Ms. Causey, I'd like to say something. Yes, Mr. McMillian. Uh, if the board members remember our first in-service training, our first get-together at Carver High School uh, shortly after we were all uh, placed in our roles, we talked about this very item. And uh, it, it sounded to me that people were in favor of it at that time to try to limit the talking. Thank you. Other board members, discussion before we vote? I have, a I have a question. Is this a suspension of normal rules for all items on the agenda throughout the entire meeting or specific ones? Ms. Scott, I, um, your motion, can you yes. clarify your motion, please? I was thinking um, uh, throughout the meeting. And this motion is time limit or number of times speaking? It was a uh, time limit, two minutes um, per debatable per member. And then I was saying motion for each, uh, each time follow up, it was uh, one minute. So if you spoke once, two minutes, then when you, if you have a follow up question, one minute. Okay, thank you. So it's not the amount of time, it, sorry, I should clarify that it's not the amount of times or amount of questions um, one could ask just a, a time limit within which you would use to ask that question board member other questions or discussion can I have a roll call vote please mr. King although I like the concept I'm going to vote no Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman? Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Causing? Ms. Causey? Uh, I think, uh, I vote no. Ms. Joes? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes, please. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Offerman? I do not hear Mr. Offerman, Ms. Causey. So the vote is six in favor, five opposed. So that is not a two thirds majority then. Okay, the motion fails. Does so the next item on the agenda is the minutes of the closed session. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, <coughs> promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees 
employees or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.vcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item on the agenda is public comment. Because the board is meeting virtually for today's meeting, only written public comments can be accepted. Comments may be emailed to boe at vcps.org, and these comments will be distributed to the Board of Education members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. Additionally, if there is an issue related to uh, board-specific work, uh, that work can either be done through a committee or um, in another manner. The next item on the agenda is item E, new business, personnel matters. And for that, we call on Ms. Lowry. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, deceased recognition of service. Board members, is there discussion on these personnel matters? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits E1 through E3? So moved, Mac. Do I have a second? Second, Q. Second, row. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Ricci? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes, please. <coughs> Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. 12 votes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Uh, Ms. Lowry, uh, excuse me, the next item on the agenda is new business, administrative appointments, and for that we call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, everyone. Madam Chair and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal of Watershed Public Charter School, Assistant Principal of Cedarmere Elementary School, Assistant Principal of Woodlawn High School, Assistant Principal of Patasco High School and Center for the Arts, Assistant Principal at Deep Creek Elementary School, Assistant Principal at Chadwick Elementary School, Assistant Principal at Seneca Elementary School, Assistant Principal at Parkville High School, and the Executive Director of Research and Data Analytics, Division of Research Accountability and Assessment. Do I have a motion to accept the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit F1? So moved. Lisa Mack. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Offerman? 11 votes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. The motion carries. Our first candidate is Michael Bill. 
assistant principal at Cedarmere Elementary School. He brings 12 years of service in Baltimore County. Prior to this appointment, he was the teacher and stat teacher at Lock Raven Technical Academy, as well as he served as a classroom teacher at Middlesex Elementary School and Halstead Academy. Congratulations. Congratulations. Our next candidate is Yolanda Booker, assistant principal at Woodlawn High School. She brings 13 years of service in Baltimore County. Uh, prior to this appointment, she was the teacher, resource teacher at Hollibird Middle School, stat teacher at Cadensville Center for Alternative Studies and Woodlawn High School, reading teacher at Deer Park Middle Magnet, mentor teacher at Deer, pa Deer Park Middle Magnet and Woodlawn Middle, uh, as well as she has years of service in Baltimore City Public Schools and the School District of Philadelphia. Congratulations, Ms. Booker. Congratulations. Our next candidate is Natasha A. Counts at, as the assistant principal at Patapsco High School in the Center for the Arts. She brings 21 years of service. Uh, she was an English teacher at Deer Park Middle Magnet, Kenwood High, Golden Ring Middle, Southwest Academy, and Randallstown High School. Congratulations, Ms. Counts. Yeah. Congratulations. Yay. <laughs> Megan Davis, assistant principal at Deep, at Deep Creek Elementary School. Uh, she brings 11 years of service in Baltimore County. Uh, she was the <laughs> former resource teacher at Deep Creek Elementary classroom teacher at Gunpowder, as well as Mars Estate, uh, and was a part of the Aspiring Leader Program in 2018. Congratulations, Ms. Davis. Congratulations. Lindsay Lone, Assistant Principal at Chadwick Elementary School. Uh, she brings 13 years of service in Baltimore County. Uh, she was the former stat teacher at Dogwood Elementary, classroom teacher, and resource teacher at Winden Elementary School. Congratulations. Congratulations. Our next candidate is Amy Romeski, assistant principal at Seneca Elementary School. Uh, she brings 13 years of service in Baltimore County. Uh, prior to this appointment, she was the stat teacher at Essex Elementary, as well as a classroom teacher at Warren Elementary School and Randallstown Elementary School, and she too was a part of the Aspiring Leaders Program in 2012. Congratulations. Congratulations. Willis Spencer, Assistant Principal at Parkville High School. He brings eight years of service in Baltimore County. He was the instrumental music teacher at Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts as well as Windsor Mill Middle School. Congratulations, Spencer. Yes, congratulations. The next position is Lori Whitney, uh, principal at Watershed Public Charter School. She brings 17 years of experience in Baltimore County. Uh, previously, she was the assistant principal part-time at Baltimore Highlands Elementary and part-time at Lansdowne Elementary. She served as a school counselor in Middlesex Elementary, as well as a vocal music teacher at Mars Estate Elementary and Deer Deep Creek Middle. She also participated in the Aspiring Leaders Program in 2017. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations. And our last candidate is Dr. Eric L. Minus, Executive Director, Research and Data Analytics. He is new to Baltimore County. He has served as a high school principal in Montgomery County Public Schools. Previously, he served as the Director of School Support and Improvement in Montgomery County Public Schools. He was the Administrative Director at Howard County Public Schools, and he served in a variety of roles of principal of a high school, a middle school, assistant principal, and science teacher, all in Montgomery County Public Schools, and a few years serving as a science and team leader in Newport News City Schools. Congratulations, Dr. Eric Minus. Congratulations and welcome. That concludes my report and appointments. 
The next item on the agenda is new business collective bargaining master agreements. And for that, we call on Ms. Lowry and Mr. Duke to present. Thank you, Ms. Causey. I will yield to Mr. Duke to share the bargaining master agreements. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. This evening, I would ask the board to consider and approve the tentatively agreed to edits, changes, and additions to the master agreement between the Board of Education and each of our collective bargaining units. I would request that the board vote on each individually, starting with the Council Council 67, Local 434, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, AFSCME. Thank you, Mr. Duke. Board members, is there discussion related to the uh, case master agreements? I'm sorry, board members. Do I have a motion to approve the collective bargaining master agreements for case? So moved, Ms. Pastua. Thank you. Do I have Seconded. a second? Second, thank you. Is there any discussion, board members? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Offerman? 11 votes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. The motion carries. Madam Chair, I would I'm ask sorry. the board to consider. Excuse me, um, Mr. Duke. Um, we need to correct one thing, Ms. Diffler. Uh, Mr. Rashid, as the student member of the board uh, by Maryland state law, is not allowed to vote on a master agreement. That is correct, Ms. Causey. My apologies. So the votes are 10 in favor. Yes, thank you. And so we'll show Mr. Offerman as absent. Yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. So that carries. Mr. Duke? I would ask the board's consideration and approval of the master agreement between the board and the education support professionals of Baltimore County, ESPBC. Do I have a motion to approve the collective bargaining master agreement for ESPBC? So moved, Max. Is there a second? Second, second. Ms. Pasteur. Thank you. Board members, any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ten votes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. That um, motion carries. Mr. Duke? Madam Chair, I would ask the board's consideration and vote to approve the master agreement between the board and Council 67 of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, AFSCME. 
Do I have a motion to approve the collective bargaining master agreement for AFSCME? So moved, Max. Do I have a second? Second, Molly. Any discussion, board members? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Ashtor? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ten votes, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Duke. That motion carries. Madam Chair, I would request the board's consideration and vote to approve the master agreement between the Board of Education and the Organization of Professional Employees, OPE. Do I have a motion to approve the collective bargaining master agreements for BCPS OPE? So moved, Max. Do I have a second? Second, Ms. Pasteur. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. 10 votes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Madam the Chair, I would be. No, the, the motion carries. Go ahead, Mr. Duke. Madam Chair, I would request the board's consideration and vote to approve the master agreement between the board and the, the <clears throat> Teachers Association of Baltimore County, TABCO. Do I have a motion to approve the collective bargaining master agreements for TABCO? Move, Kuhn. Do I have a second? Second, Ms. Pasteur. Is there a discussion? This is Lisa Mack. Yes. Um, I have a concern about this agreement because of the fact that there are no steps included. And to me, the most important person in the schoolhouse is our teachers. We already have a retention problem. We um, are having job fairs. We have a number of uh, resignations and retirements that we just approved. And I'm, I'm just very torn about this because of the fact that it includes no steps. Mr. Duke, do you have a response to Ms. Mack's concern? Or While I understand um, the board member's concern, I also would respectfully remind the board that um, the TAPCO leadership ha is in agreement with the fiscal um, aspects of the master agreement and they fully understand that for this fiscal year coming up, fiscal year 21, that steps will not be funded for any of our employees and any of the collective bargaining units. Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Hen? Thank you. I share Ms. Mack's concerns, and while I understand that there is only so much you can do in one year and that TABCO supports this agreement, I am also torn because for the same reasons that Ms. Mack stated. I believe our priorities 
need to be shifted and that we do need to place higher priority on our teachers. And that doesn't happen in one year. However, it needs to happen. And it is deeply disappointing that we are not in a position to be able to fund steps within this budget. And I understand we're in an MOE budget. However, this is unprecedented. And while I will support the agreement, it is not without a heavy heart because our teachers We can't hear anything. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I apologize. I had stated that I agree with Ms. Mack's comment, and while I will support this agreement, I'm deeply concerned that it does not include steps for our teachers because we need to take care of them first and foremost and our priorities need to reflect our commitment to our teachers. And while I understand that we can't make that shift in one year, especially with an MOE budget, it's a change that we need to make and it needs to happen and we need to pivot to make it happen. And we show our priorities where our dollars lie. And this agreement is not reflective of the fact that our teachers should be our first priority as those that have the greatest impact along with our school administrators on our students. And that is our core mission. And this agreement needs to reflect our core mission of teaching and learning, and it does not. So while I'll support this agreement, we need to pivot and we need to start putting our dollars where they matter most. And that is with instructional salaries. Thank you. Ms. Causey, this is Ms. Pasture. Yes. Okay, I, I just want to point out that during my tenure in Baltimore County, there were times when I was frozen on step. There were times when I got no poll of it. Um, uh, but we knew that out that Tabco or Case were working for us, and that it was um, a, a temporary thing. I agree with those who have spoken before, um, that it is sad that we are not able to do it, um, but the uh, fiscal constraints speak to that. It is not because we do not care about our, our staff. And I go to Dr. Williams' strategic plan because I know as a career person, a career educator, that we are going to work exceedingly hard, particularly this year, um, but all years, but particularly in light of this, to make sure that we give our teachers in terms of support, professional development, and all of those things that they continuously ask for so that we make their lives in the classroom smoother so that our children will learn. I am confident that we will get through this and that they are career professionals as well. Thank you. Other board members? Ms. Causey, this is Mr. King. Yes. Um, I, I fully agree with um, Ms. Matt and her concerns about not um, providing steps and raises. But my concern overall is the fact that there are a significant amount of unemployed people now across the entire country. And um, with the economy facing the headwinds it is and um, state and county revenue uh, dropping significantly. I think this is a prudent step for us to take, and I'm hopeful that we can quickly bounce back and make um, make up for this uh, come next year. Thank you. Thank you. Other board members? Ms. Causey. Yes, Ms. Rowe. I just wanted to concur with other board members say I do think it's important to fund um, the steps. I'll vote for the master agreement. Um, 
but I, I would have hoped that we would have found a place in the budget to be able to reduce some other things in order to fund the steps for the teachers. Thank you. Other board members? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Hen. Yes. Unless there's someone else that hasn't had a chance to speak, I'll defer to them. But I, I did want to add that we ask our teachers to make enough sacrifices as it is on a day-to-day -day basis. It, this feels like one more with not including steps in, in this agreement and in our budget. And to put that on their backs is not a decision that I can support. And there are other cuts. There, there are other opportunities within this budget, and we're going to be discussing that later tonight, I know, but these two go hand in hand, that call us to look other places outside the schoolhouse um, to also make sacrifices, because that's what this is. It's a sacrifice. And that shouldn't rest squarely on our teachers. And that's what we are looking to do here. And while salaries are the largest percentage of our budget, and that's the first and easiest pass, just because something is the easiest decision to make doesn't make it the right decision. So I, like Ms. Mack, am torn on this one. It does have the support of TAPCO. And I, I acknowledge and thank the, those that put so much effort into getting us to this point. And I recognize the difficulty given the current economic circumstances. However, we cannot continue to put this on the backs of our educators. Thank you. Ms. Causey, this is Ms. Pastor. If there's no one else who has not spoken, mm -hmm. I'd like to chime in one more time, please. Uh, certainly, Ms. Pastor. And go right ahead. Oh, OK, thank you. Um, I certainly, I am a schoolhouse wonk. I feel this intrinsically, but I also feel intrinsically that we pass through the um, other contracts and that our school day, as we have spoken before, begins when those children get on the bus with the bus drivers, that they are taught and impacted on every day by our custodians. They are impacted every day about, by our cafeteria workers and all people who are connected with the school. And as Mr. Duke said, this is a sweeping cut. So I feel it in my heart and in my bones, but this is where we are and we will, I am sure, I believe in the work that we're doing and, and that all of the bargaining agents are doing and that we will get through this and they will get those steps. But they are not the only ones who impact our children and we said nothing about the other groups. So I uh, would like to make a few comments as I've not yet Ms. commented. Um, Ms. Kazi, this is Molly. If I could comment, I've not commented as well. Certainly, go ahead. Um, to re re reiterate what Ms. Pastor said, it is about the teachers, but it's also about all the other employees, the bus drivers, the custodians, um, our site, you know, everybody that works in the schoolhouse and outside of it. It's in the back of everybody. Unfortunately, this is a um, global recession pandemic we're all going through, and it's not something the board supports, but we have this agreement. And if we could, we'd obviously offer the best that we could to our teachers, our principals, our custodians, our bus drivers, our cafeteria workers, everybody, the schoolhouse functions because it's a function of all of these people. And we should not forget um, it takes a village to build a child. <coughs> Other board members, discussion? I just wanted to make some brief remarks. This is not the agreement that 
any of us on the board had hoped for. We, in February, which seems like an eternity ago at this point, voted for a 2% COLA for all five of our bargaining units. We also voted for steps for all of our um, bargaining units. So it is indeed with a heavy heart that we are not able to follow through on what we wanted to make a commitment um, to our very valuable staff. Um, has, as has been pointed out, is everywhere in our organization from um, the first step onto the bus to the last step off of the bus, uh, to the after school activities, to everything uh, between the bells ringing. And even now in the summer, we have our 12 month employees that work diligently to plan and prepare for the year ahead. So it is not the, it is not the agreements that we wanted, but given the pandemic, the impacts of COVID, the economic crisis in which we find ourselves, we as a board have um, had conversations, we've sent in questions, we've had, um, you know, listened to our um, bargaining team uh, provide us reports with the updates on their negotiations with the master agreement negotiate with the uh, unions negotiating teams. And we need to understand that we are doing the best that we can given this uh, dire situation and that we do. You're muted. Excuse me, Dr. Williams has been working diligently even during the pandemic on the strategic plan that will help move the school system forward. I, Ms. Stifler? Yes, Ms. Causey. Okay, my screen says it's unmuting, but it's not going away. So are you hearing me okay? Yes. yes. Yes, we can hear okay. you, Ms. Cause. Thank you. So I, uh, I concur with my uh, several board members that this is not the agreement that we wanted, but we are hopeful for improvements in the future and that we will be all working together to do the best that we can for our children, given, given these circumstances. With that, are there any other comments? Dr. Williams? I'll save my comments um, when we talk about the FY21 operating budget, but I appreciate uh, the feedback from board members. Thank you. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Kuhn? Do we have a motion? Yes, we have a motion by Mr. Kuhn, second by Ms. Pasteur. Sorry, it's been a while. Yes. Okay. Thank, you, thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Ms. N? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. This is Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Reluctantly, yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ten in favor, Ms. Causey. Thank you. The motion carries. We thank you, Mr. Duke, for your work. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of the emergency boundary recommendation. And for that, we call on Ms. Byers, Mr. Dixit, and Ms. Appler. Good evening. This is Pete Dixit, uh, Chair Ms. Causey, Vice Chair Ms. Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. As you'll recall, 
uh, on May 19th, we presented for your consideration a boundary change recommendation for the village at Gunpowder Falls. The boundary change will align the attendance areas for the village at Gunpowder Falls to a single elementary school, Seven Oaks, and a single middle school, Pine Grove Middle School. The proposed change will not reassign any students currently attending any of the affected schools. Uh, in response to board's comments, we invited uh, public to provide feedback to the board by email and online comment form or by regular mail. The boundary study website and online comment form were made available to the public on Monday, May 11th, and comments were accepted through Saturday, June 13th. There were 33 comments received. Almost all the comments supported the boundary recommendation of Seven Oaks Elementary and Pine Grove Middle School. The primary reasons cited for supporting the recommendation were overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle School and Perry Hall Schools, overcrowding at Pine Grove Elementary School and the presence of relocatable buildings there, and the transportation efficiency and proximity to Pine Grove Middle School. So all in all, our recommendation was supported in public comments. So we are here today uh, to request your approval for the alignment of the boundary. Thank you for that presentation. Board members? Ms. Causey, Lily Rowe? Yes. Uh, Mr. Dickett, fix it. What were the reasons that the people who opposed it opposed it? We really did not see any opposing of the recommendation. We saw some miscellaneous comments about other things in general, but none of the uh, comments that we saw were opposing. Some of the general comments were that the development should be placed into one elementary and one middle school, which is what we are doing. And in general, they said there's a concern of new developments approved in the area and there's a need for school facilities to support the growth. But that has nothing to do with our recommendation that we are talking about. And uh, one of the comments regarding transportation routes and bus overcrowding at Seven Oaks, and hopefully this will solve, if anything, the bus crowding uh, in general in that area. It's not going to add any overcrowding to the buses. So all in all, we did not find any negative recommendation for our recommendation, N negative comment for our recommendation. Thank you. Actually, board members, I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the emergency boundary recommendation for the village at Gunpowder Falls as presented, and then we can have additional discussion. So moved. So moved. Thank you. Is there any additional discussion on the motion? Good evening, this is Kathleen Causey, Chair of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. We are now reconvening our meeting, our special meeting of the board of June 23rd, 2020. We had to recess uh, due to technical difficulties and uh, now we are reconvening and I will ask Ms. Stifler to uh, do a roll call to confirm a quorum. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Ms. Joes? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. 
We have nine board members on the call, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Ms. Diffler. We had just finished uh, the unfinished business consideration of the emergency boundary recommendation, which carried. Um, I would just like to take a moment to ask Mr. Nussbaum, given that we have nine board members uh, and previously we had more, what is the um, proper procedure on taking votes in terms of board members being involved in the discussion and then taking the vote? Do we need to wait to uh, have other members enter the meeting so that they can hear discussion before they vote on the next items? I, I think it's preferable for board members to be present during the discussion so that they can hear everything that's going on before they take the vote. Okay. So but I, I don't know how long it's going to be before people can, can rejoin. That's the problem. Okay. Let us get started then. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business consideration of the final fiscal year 2021 operating budget. Uh, for that, we're going to call on Dr. Scriven, Mr. Saris, and Mr. Tantliff to present. Okay, good evening, uh, Madam Chair. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, defer to Dr. Williams, who I believe has some uh, opening comments. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. So I would like to recognize Dr. Scriven, uh, Mr. Saris, and Mr. Tanley, and the many staff for uh, the work that they've done to respond to my many questions about our own processes and the work that was done with our budget. We collaborated with our central office staff and our union president and we'll continue this collaboration as I develop future budgets in the years to come. I'm not surprised that we are at a maintenance of effort budget based on the economic impact that COVID-19 has had. And I'm not optimistic about the future or, or what the future will hold regarding our economy. However, I am optimistic that my drive and focus will continue to be on schools and, and identifying what students and staff will need to be successful. My cabinet of senior leaders who have had great responsibility within their respective areas and each member is student centered and has experience with students, staff and communities and or business partnerships. I'm also optimistic that the work of senior leadership and the five union presidents um, to continue our focus and priority, looking at work conditions and identifying uh, such priorities as we continue the work. So I must give a shout out to Nick Argyros um, from OPE, Brian Epps from Ashme, Tom DeHart from Case, Cindy Sexton, Tapco, and Jeanette Young from ESPBC. So tonight, I've actually I uh, have Nick Argyros, who would like to make a comment on behalf of the five union presidents. Nick. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Han, and members of the board. <clears throat> I speak on behalf of all the bargaining unit leaders this evening. We are here in solidarity to support Dr. Williams's adjusted budget plan. The budget cuts have impacted numerous areas, including employee compensation, we understand the budget cuts due to the current financial climate and Dr. Williams's desire to preserve school resources and instructional programs. Dr. Williams is committed to having us at the table to help create the budget for FY 2022. And we look forward to collaborating with his executive staff on decisions affecting the district's budget now and in the future. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Ms. Arduous, and to our other union presidents. So good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, Dr. Williams, board members, 
<clears throat> I'm joined here, as you can see tonight, by Mrs. Harris and Mr. Tantliff to share our amended MOE or maintenance of effort budget. On May 29th, 2020, County Council adopted our proposed budget at maintenance of effort, which equated to a $20.2 million reduction. I'd like to bring to your attention that in our initially proposed budget, uh, there was uh, an allocation for step increases at $16.8 million. There was an allocation of a 1% uh, COLA across the board, which would have been a $9.4 million uh, cost, and an FY20 2% uh, COLA for the three out of the five unions that did not receive one uh, last year, which equated uh, to a cost of $4.1 million. Uh, when you do the math, it totals $30.3 million. When you look at the $20.2 million that we were uh, directed uh, to cut to take us to maintenance of effort, when you subtract that from that 30.3, uh, that leaves a balance of $10.1 million. So subsequently, we, ha we had to make some additional adjustments and prioritize how we were going to move forward. Uh, it was pretty much a non-negotiable that we needed to honor uh, the FY20 a 2% COLA for the three unions out of the five that did not receive it last year. And then we knew that we also had to honor uh, the 1% longevity. That 2% uh, COLA for the three out of the five, as I uh, alluded to earlier, equated to $4.1 million. Mm -hmm. And the 1% longevity was five million dollars in cost. Uh, when you add that up and subtract that, we were at a deficit of four point five million dollars. And subsequently the superintendent uh, made additional reductions out of administrative costs so that we would at least be able to honor and give a 1% COLA across the board, uh, which, was, which cost us 9.4 a million. When it's all said and done with, we're left with uh, a percentage, a very small percentage um, in which to work. Uh, if you want the specifics on the reductions that uh, Dr. Williams made an administrative cost. Uh, I will uh, itemize those for you. It was a hundred thousand in administrative salary freeze for directors and above. It was a one million hiring freeze, approximately ten administrative positions. One point five million in overnight travel conferences and leadership development. Seven hundred thousand out of curriculum development. 350,000 out of contracted employees, 105,000 uh, in cell phone stipends, 100,000 office supplies, 150,000 other supplies and material, and 460,000 in miscellaneous contract services, uh, which totaled the 4.5 million uh, that we had to find uh, to go along with the 5.0 million that was left after we gave the 2% and the longevity to be able to honor the 1% color across the board. Um, at this time, before we open it up for questions, I, I would like to defer uh, to Mr. Saris. Um, as we all took heed to your remarks uh, that you made 
uh, earlier during uh, the presentation with human resources around our ability to uh, prioritize and make cuts, uh, which would have afforded us uh, to do the uh, step increase as well as the COLA. Uh, I'd like George just to give a little additional information of, of why we were just not in a, a financial position uh, to be able to do that. So Mr. Saris, I'd like to turn it over to you at this time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Scriven. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair and members of the board. Uh, just uh, so you can understand the timeline, Dr. Williams has had had the budget office uh, working on this for the last six weeks. And what the approach that we took was to uh, identify the items in the budget uh, that that we had to actually work with to find these administrative cost reductions. Um, and of course, the first priority was to uh, not to impact the classroom at all in any way. And um, we also had to look through uh, a large number of our fixed costs, things like utilities and non-public placements and uh, you know vehicle facilities, network maintenance, um, and uh, identify the things that were uh, essentially our discretionary budget. Um, so we identified about fifteen million dollars uh, that uh, we that we classify as discretionary. And in order to uh, achieve the cost reductions that we needed to fund the one percent cola. Uh, it is tantamount to about a 17% across the board increase in in all of those uh, thousands of line items, which the staff uh, diligently went through. Um, and so, added to this to the administrative salary and hiring savings and uh, and some curriculum development costs, we were able. Uh, to meet Dr. Williams' target to uh, move ahead with this 1% COLA, as well as his long-term goal, which is to uh, to move administrative costs lower this year, next year, and, and beyond that. So at this time, Madam Chair, uh, we'd like to open it up uh, for any uh, questions from the board. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Saris, I have a question about the number you just cited, the 17%. Could you please clarify um, what you were referring to with regards to administrative costs? when you said that were looked at line, line item by line item? Yeah, those are costs um, like operating supplies, office supplies, travel, mileage reimbursement, contracted services, contract employee, salaries, phone stipends, other supplies and other materials, um, essentially the, the, main, the, the crux of those accounts. So when you said 17%, that's not a 17% reduction. I, you lost me there with that number. Can you explain? Well, we started, we, the total uh, budget available in all of the accounts was 15 million. And we were, uh, in addition to the administrative salary cuts and, and the curriculum development cuts, we needed another $2.6 million. And so the, uh, the 17 percent of the 15 million excuse me you may have we may have lost the connection um, it, uh, 
I think we lost George Witt. You want to jump in? Sure. <clears throat> so uh, just to clarify, Ms. Hen. Hi, Mr. Tantlow. <clears throat> Hi. So we uh, went through the entire budget, <clears throat> and there were certain mandatory things we backed out. So, of course, salaries, but then we went through all the built-ins. We had to back out those critical special education expenses, uh, building maintenance from facilities. So we went through the budget and took out things that uh, were mandatory and really not cuttable. And when all that um, came out, we are left, as Mr. Saris mentioned, with a little over fifth, a pot of $15 million. Uh, mm -hmm. Think of that as your variable budget to some extent. And not that there aren't a lot of critical things in there, but to uh, make the 1% call a foot, we needed to cut that last $2.6 million out of that bucket. Um, so that, as Mr. Saris mentioned, would be about 17%. So other than the mandatory lines being backed out, which were quite sizable, okay. the impact will be the central office budgets. Uh, the line items that we're looking at will be cut by 17%. Okay, of the discretionary items that were identified as such? Of the 15 million that we thought were, we could all agree were, after we backed out things that we could all agree are uh, mandatory and not uh, really reducible. Okay. Hi, um, this is Molly. I'm, I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to the staff and Dr. Williams for presenting this budget. I know it wasn't an easy task. Um, the one line that I do remember from you saying is that no program <clears throat> serving students was um, eliminated, and and that is good. My question is about the curriculum development where you're getting a eight hundred thousand um, dollar reduction. What does that entail? Uh, so that entails. Uh, something that we would typically do uh, in the summer, which is uh, revise and rewrite curriculum. And uh, we are able in this one time situation to use money from the CARES Act to, uh, to maintain that process. And of course this year, the process is going to be focused on developing a, uh, a remote curriculum that can be delivered both in person and uh, in a parallel track online so that regardless of how we open in September, uh, we will have adapted the existing curriculum to that dual role. So, from my understanding, the CARES Act is being used to for additional devices because this board had reduced the one-to-one -one ratio. So, some money from the CARES Act is going towards providing devices for all of our elementary school children for the remote learning, and some of it is going to feeding our children. And the rest of it is what I'm just confused because you're talking about the CARES Act funding curriculum as well. Yeah. So it's. It's going, uh, the CARES Act, as you correctly state, about 10 million for devices, about 5 million for our feeding program, about 2 million uh, to modify our facilities uh, and make them adaptable uh, for the fall to uh, encourage safety and social distancing. And uh, the remaining 5 million is for curriculum and curriculum development and student health. So uh, all of those needs are built into the grant application. Thank you, Mr. Sarah, Dr. Scriven, and Mr. Tantliff. Um, I know it's a monumental task putting a budget together, so uh, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Other board members? Yes, this is Lisa Mack. Mr. Saris, when do we get the CARES money? Um, 
Well, my hope is that we would hear something this week, possibly Friday. Uh, when we first started discussing this back in uh, May, uh, the application deadline was May 12th and the money was due May 27th. Uh, MSD has rolled back those, that timeline uh, ultimately, the application deadline was June 12th, so that I am sticking to our uh, the the win the two week window in which we might uh, hopefully receive the award. But that's the best estimate I can give, and I I just haven't had any other updates to share. Is there any chance that we would not get it? Very little, I would think. Very, very little. That's a very good answer. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for your work. That's, that's my only question. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Saris. This is Mr. Keyes. Good evening. Good evening. I, Good evening. I, I wanted to take a look at the CARES Act funding because I'm on page one of the summary that was provided for uh, the uh, superintendent budget adjustments at maintenance of effort. And in the third paragraph, it talks about the CARES Act funding that we are, are waiting for and hoping arrives immediately. So I just wanted to make sure I'm clear on what you have here. Um, it says there's $14.8 million to enhance remote and classroom instruction and resources. And from what I can gather, you said that $10 million is going to go to devices, and then there's going to be $2 million to modify schools, and then I, I thought I heard $5 million for meals. Yes. Um, the I think the document that you're referring to um, aggregated the the application to align with our compass, which is our strategic plan. Um, but let me just go to the actual final document. Um, it might be uh, easier to, to communicate. Um, so we have uh, $340,000 for the mailing of devices and, and instructional packets. Uh, 4.5 million to support the food and nutrition program, 10.4 million for devices, as well as some uh, software that helps us to manage the network remotely and some broadcasting equipment that will help sustain this live stream uh, broadcast that we're doing from a remote location. Uh, under the curriculum and instruction group, we have uh, the software for the self-paced summer school program. Uh, we have a lot of PPE and supplies for student health of about 700,000, um, some ad an additional 750,000 for mailing uh, the devices if need be. Uh, 1.5 six million dollars for that curriculum development that we were just talking about to build that parallel face-to-face -face remote capability um, and 1.5 million for hot spots for uh, students throughout the county which we think there are at least 4,000 families that do not have internet access uh, and uh, 380 thousand dollars for uh, some remote software to support uh, career and technology education, and, and that $2 million for facilities uh, breaks down into about a million dollars to reconfigure the health suites, to uh, basically expand them, to accommodate more students and keep those students safely distanced, uh, about 500000 for additional sanitizing efforts uh, that might be needed, uh, 200,000 for hand washing stations, 
um, and about 360,000 for uh, reconfiguring traffic flow and signage and so forth to promote distancing. And then lastly, the, uh, the grant requires that we set aside about $1.1 million for the uh, over 150,000 private schools that we have in the county. And, and my office will be, my office and uh, Billy Burke's office will be administering those grants on behalf of all those private schools who we've already reached out to and they'll be making individual applications directly to BCPS for their share. Well, thank you for the detail, Mr. Saris. I, unfortunately, I don't have whatever document you're looking at, so I do appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah, it was, I just read right from the grant application because it had the most detail. I appreciate that. Um, the one question that I have that um, I think you can really provide some insight on is regarding the devices, we have multiple contracts, right, where we're leasing devices currently. And my question to you is, are we going to use one of those facilities and create new leases or are we going to buy things outright or how will it work with this grant money? Our current plan was to purchase these outright. Um, we are obviously going to, we're going ahead with our regularly scheduled lease to expand uh, the Chromebooks to middle school. Uh, but our plan uh, for, for these dollars is right now to purchase using the current contract uh, pricing that, that we got last year. Thank you. That makes sense with one-time money. I, I appreciate that. Thank I no you. Other board members? Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes, Ms. Ms. Pasture. I, I, I want to thank all of you, I um, feel that the CARES Act has become a part of my life, um, scrutinizing it, um, and was very interested from the beginning in terms of how you were going to manipulate our situation um, to, um, to its best in using uh, the money from the CARES Act. Um, and I just have to say bravo and it it when i looked at the adjustments and i was processing uh what i had gleaned from um looking at and studying the cares act um i'm i'm impressed i mean i know that means nothing to you because this is your life but just that how <laughs> how is me uh, yes but how it meshes to make sure that we maintain the integrity of what is gonna go on in the classroom um, for our teachers and for our children under these circumstances, because we're certainly far from being out of the woods and I'm hoping that there'll be more dollars that will be eked out to offer us um, support. So thank you for um, the diligence and for the scrutiny uh, that you have put into this and making it coincide, Dr. Williams, with um, that vision. Thank you. Yes, other board members? I did just wanna take a moment to thank Dr. Williams. To thank Dr. Williams and his team, Dr. Scriven, Mr. Saris, Mr. Tantleff, um, and everyone that's worked on realigning this budget given um, the economic crisis we're in due to the pandemic and the um, limitations that we had with the maintenance of effort budget. I did want to um, ask the question, Mr. Saris had mentioned in the CARES Act that there was, um, I believe it was 700,000 
potentially for mailing devices. Was that the correct number? Right. Now, I was wondering, is there consideration given to um, having the devices picked up? We had some very organized and actually heartwarming uh, uh, pick up and drop off at the schools at the end of the year when students were turning in supplies uh, and students were picking up their diplomas. So um, is there consideration given for doing that in terms of um, a way to distribute devices and uh, save money? Yes, Madam Chair, so I'll respond to that. Um, that was our initial plan. Uh, we had a, a very detailed plan uh, to do uh, parent-student pickup, uh, but as a result of the timing and the sense of urgency to get the devices out, uh, individuals did not feel comfortable as we were in the peak of the virus uh, with coming face-to-face uh, -face and, and, and following uh, that plan. Uh, but as we move forward, uh, we make sure that we follow CDC and, and the health guidelines. Uh, and if uh, they so advise that we are uh, in a safe uh, space in terms of being able to initiate distribution that way, then by all means we would do it uh, because the financial savings are significant. Thank you. And also, Mr. Saris, in following up with the earlier um, numbers that you discussed with um, CARES, there was a number that was in the superintendent's um, summary that said 3,858,000 um, in communications and stakeholder outreach, but I didn't hear that in the list of um, numbers. So was that a roll up of several different things? Yes, that would have been a roll up of, um, among others, the hotspots, um, the, the broadcast software and the network uh, management software, um, and uh, probably the mailing um, fees and the instructional packets um, that were sent out, and um, I, I think those are the key components of that number. Okay, thank you for clarifying because I would yes. think that those are more in terms of instructional support for for our students during that time frame. So I just wanted to get clarification on that number. Um, so thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Other board members? Okay, hearing no other comments or questions, do I have motion to accept the superintendent's operating budget as presented? So moved, Ms. So, Pasteur. Second. Second. Molly. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Stifler, may I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ten votes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. The motion carries. Uh, thank you mu very much, Dr. Scriven, Mr. Saris, and Mr. Tantleff. Of course. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, Board. Have a good evening. Yeah. The next item on the agenda is uh, board member comments on the strategic plan. Dr. Williams, did you want to start? 
With the I'll report. just I'll just make it brief. Um, on uh, the previous board meeting, I presented a strategic plan focusing on five areas. Um, the board will then vote on the plan in July, but we wanted to bring it back just to receive some comments based on your review of um, the outline of this focus of our of our strategic plan and the five focus areas. So at this time, I'll turn it back over to you, Ms. Causey. Thank you. So board members, discussion, please. You can just state your name and proceed. Molly. Lisa Mack. Go ahead, Molly. Thank you. Dr. Williams, um, quick question for you. With everything that's changed around us, we do realize that um, is there a, does our curriculum change? Do we have to now write curriculum in ways that work well on virtual platforms? And additionally, do our teachers need skills um, that are appropriate or professional development for teaching online classes? And our students, the, you know, thirdly, they will need more social, emotional support. Our learning environments are different. And also our students' ability to access support from teachers and friends will be as well. I, I don't know what's going to happen in the fall. Um, does that, is that reflected in your plan because of the sudden change in the way our world has changed in dr drastic ways? So, yes. Um... We have done some in-service when we first went out on March 16th, and that was a quick turnaround. Um, the feedback and um, the support uh, was great. In terms of how we need to move forward, really looking at how we deliver our curriculum and to have that flexibility to potentially turn on a dime if we have to make a decision like we did back in, in March. So um, fortunately, we have our uh, Schoology, uh, which is a great resource. Um, we will have to do some in-service, particularly for our new staff and new administrators. Uh, you heard earlier about some revisions to the curriculum. Um, <clears throat> and the last piece you talked about, our students. Uh, as we are, this is not a part of today's presentation, but as we're talking about the recovery plan, um, the staff is looking at those students who were disengaged for a variety of reasons, those students who already had gaps and um, trying to assess what may be the best next steps for them. Um, and those students who are making level changes that kids who are going, who are coming new to our system those students who are um, being promoted from elementary to middle and middle to high, those transitional years. And, and, and that's also within an elementary, going from second grade to third grade. So we have some work to prepare. Um, we hear that there may be another surge. Uh, um, so we have to be nimble enough to be able to turn on a dime. Um, and that was the challenging part um, that we in, encounter now that we experience this and and we're collecting feedback and trying to look at various models um, and stay tuned because I will be bringing that to the board next month just for a preview and for your feedback. Uh, I, I think we have to do more around the training of all of our stakeholders regarding um, online learning. Um, and even how we roll it out. But uh, as I shared this strategic plan with our principals um, today during the principals leadership development meeting, we, we did talk about just the, the current state that we're in with COVID-19 and how this may impact our progress with the strategic plan. And it may direct us what other action items that we need to put forth. Um, so, um, we are, we're trying to stay ahead of the curve and be well prepared, um, but we have to be nimble enough if we have to turn on a dime uh, to do something differently with our, with our schools. 
uh, we learned a lot from this one experience. And it wasn't ideal, absolutely it wasn't ideal. Um, and so there's been some learning and some things that we don't want to re repeat. So this, the strategic plan is, is the guy that is guiding the work, is getting us to be real clear in what we're going to do, not only in central office, but in our schools. Um, but we do recognize if we have uh, another outbreak, if we have to close, uh, we wanna make sure our students, staff, and then our parents have to be prepared for a different learning experience as well. So I thank you for those questions. We are looking at ways to really build the capacity. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Other board members? Hi, this is Lisa Mack. Um, Dr. Williams, I have just a few questions. Um, one is for elementary school under focus area one, learning accountability and results. Can you explain why we are using MAP, which is growth instead of MCAP, which is proficiency in so, our measurements? So I'm gonna take that question tonight was really comments and not questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. But I will say, I, I will say you keep in mind MCAP is a state assessment and you saw what happened this year. Um, it's good to see our students growth over time. Um, so we can look at what they've done within a year, what they've done multiple years. When it comes to the MCAT, the, the state assessment, um, you know, the state is looking at some modifications and we don't know exactly what that may look like. Uh, and so keep in mind, the state assessment has changed the name um, multiple times. And so with the fact that we're not sure exactly what that will look like. Um, the research team has done a good job of looking, looking at MAP. Um, we will have to look at the state assessment because that is such a public facing document or results uh, as part of our report card from the state. Um, but I appreciate that question. I would just probably put it in the parking lot so the research team can come back and give um, a rationale. But again, it's how we're looking and what we're looking at multiple years and what a data that would be available. That growth is important, but we also still have to look at MCAP or whatever we may call it, because um, it will be a part of our report cards for every school. And I just have a follow-up question on MAP. Um, I, I believe until this point in time, we measured growth against the 50th percentile. Is that correct? We are looking at growth in a different way. Uh, I want to say it's 61 or higher. Per, yeah, so that yep. is a change this year under your plan. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, I applaud that. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm glad glad to see that. Um, for our middle schools and elementary schools. Um, and then I just had one other quick question where we show increase the percentage of students, increase the percentage of students. At any point, will the plan include by what percentage we want to see an increase? Incre is it gonna ever say increase by 5% or 10%? Is that gonna be added at some point? And I'm under um, focus area one again. So schools will have targets and we'll be looking at a multi-year, uh, a three-year, five, eight. Um, again, I will take that question, uh, Ms. Causey. Tonight, um, we can circle back when we present the strategic plan again, but as was presented before, we talked about targets for every school. And if you recall, there was a, a school A mock-up as right, well as that was a school slide yeah. seven mm -hmm. yeah but will we have a, will we have a bcps dashboard if you will that is will be fed up from all of our schools so as the uh, team presented there will be a bcps dashboard um that will have our data disaggregated um and an opportunity for the public to see our progress. Um, 
and that's being worked on now to update our dashboard to reflect the disaggregated data based on Great. the metrics that we will be using. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Williams, uh, this is Ms. Pastor and Ms. Causey, may I jump in at this point? Yes. All right. Uh, Wait a minute, I need to go back, look at this. Uh, Dr. Williams, um, since we're, we're just doing comments, the one thing uh, that you have included here, now let me back up. M uh, some of the things that you have in here, clearly we have seen in other documents because these are the things that um, I, I think all school systems and parents um, sort of expect that we have and, and direct that we move, which we move, but we all don't always get that. We can see that here in Baltimore County. But well, what you have done, let's, uh, I'm looking at goal, college and career success grounded in BCPS policy 0100 equity guided by community prior, priorities. And so, what you're doing, in, it's like how you do a goal or a good teacher does the goal or the unit plan. You're starting at the end without end point going to college or having career success. So equity for everyone, guided by community priorities. Every community we have in Baltimore County is different in some very real ways, even though the expectation for our children uh, certainly would be the same and if you were doing um, some sort of, of um, not a graph, but one of those little things with colors and pictures, pies and things and lines and circles, all of it would go right back up to college and career success. So I just want to uh, say that I appreciate that you have articulated so everyone can see that where you're going comes out of that equity lens and also taking a look at our various communities. And if you were going to do this in some pattern other than this chart as we're seeing it, I would like to see, because I think we've talked about it enough in your, in, uh, I know what's in your brain about this, that it really is cyclical and that you cannot, even though you've looked at focus area of one, two, three, four, five, you have looked at those five areas, but the reality is it all goes around in the circle, understanding that one touches the other. And so I'm real hopeful that that'll be a big part of your conversation um, with your cabinet so that they're having that same conversation with their school administrators so folks understand that when the instruction is tighter, and I mean visibly tighter, and that will impact on what things are going to look like in terms of behavior. When we start identifying children for gifted and talented and AP, even beyond their behavior, you're gonna see some behavior shifts. And when you are doing, uh, continuously doing what you did in your 100 days, listening and staying engaged and having those community um, uh, conversations, the whole thing will change. So I just uh, really, want to say, so let me turn my video on, and say applause just for the way you articulated where you're going and knowing that putting down that career college readiness, or college career readiness, and taking a look at community and all of those other pieces, that's where we need to go. But you've also set your bar at a point that anyone can come back and hold you accountable for reaching that those ends. So it'll go beyond whatever the state tests are or norms. It will go to how we are seeing naturally our children walk across the stage or how naturally they are doing well, well on these tests. 
So you've, you've put your own criterion out there for how you expect to be measured. I applaud that. And I know you'll stay on staff to that end. So thank you for that. Other board members? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Hen. Yes. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Williams, I appreciate and, and applaud you and thank you for your work on, on Compass. I appreciate how clearly the focus areas are outlined. And as Ms. Pastor stated, they, they touch one another. And I would go one step farther and state that not only are they do they rely on each other as dependencies, but they also represent a hierarchy of needs and they are not equal in where our attention needs to be. And I'm looking particularly at focus area two in safe and supportive environment, because if kids don't feel safe and supported, then they cannot achieve. If teachers don't feel safe and supported in the classroom, they cannot teach, children cannot learn. And that is one area in which, quite frankly, we have come up short. And in, in terms of priorities, where we place our resource, where we are focusing, I don't know that I would weight these equally in terms of where our focus needs to be in terms of what we need to be focused on for the desired outcomes. So where the desired outcomes are in focus area one, in terms of learning and accountability and results, and that's what our mission is, we are about teaching and learning. There are certain of these focus areas that we need to concentrate more heavily on even than others in order to get us there. And others that are drivers of success in the other focus areas. Focus area three, high performing workforce. How many teachers are we losing because of undesirable behaviors in the classroom that aren't being addressed. And I have concerns and would like to see specifics around focus area two in how we are gonna create a more safe and supportive environment, particularly in the classrooms for our teachers and our students. That's an area that hasn't been addressed that I believe this board needs to address and continue to address through policy and to work with you on. And I think we'll be a driver for success in a lot of the other areas. So um, that's one area I look forward to being provided more detail on. And I think we'll um, drive success in a lot of the other areas you've outlined. Madam Chair, if I may respond to uh, Ms. Pastor and Vice Chair Hinn, um, I Certainly. just want to just to remind uh, the board in essence, these five focus areas are, are not mutually exclusive. Um, and um, you have to look at, in my eyes, having served as a principal um, in two different levels, um, you have to look at all of these areas. And I will say um, one to uh, Ms. Pastor, you know, the schools, our goal is always college and career readiness. I mean, the CCR, that's that's the benchmark um, for the state. Um, and it was just fascinating to see all of our students who graduated and to look at, you know, their, their, how well they did and, and in some places where they are going. And so we constantly have to have a metric where we're pushing the envelope to have more kids cross, cross that that stage figuratively now, um, but to be prepared for whatever they want to do after after high school. But it doesn't start in high school. It starts in, and, and that's why we're looking at certain um, areas in each level to see how our students are doing. And if they're not doing a particularly well in that area, what are we doing about it? So the gap won't get wider. Um, but it's interesting, both of you touched on something that happened today as I met with the principals about this strategic plan. And I think what I'll do um, when we circle back in, in July to show you the alignment of the strategic plan with the schoolhouse. Because after it's all said and done, it's like for the educators on the board, when you've done your school progress plan, 
I was guilty of it. You did it. It looks nice. And it's in the, in the binder and it's sat on the shelf. And then one would say the real work. Well, that's not what we're doing in Baltimore County. Everything that we're doing associated with the strategic plan, it has to be felt in every division. And more importantly, it has to be felt in every school. Now, the way in which a school may manage some of these areas is based on the data, um, where they may have to spend a little bit more time and resources in a particular area. But these, these I see these focus areas are not mutually exclusive. You know, schools have to consider all of these to say, okay, what am I going to do this first year or these first six months and what I'm going to do the next six months? So I would, I would suggest that um, our school's entry and what they do will vary from school to school because that's what the data is saying. You know, school, and even within a zone, you may have two level-like schools that are operating differently. And that's kind of like how our students are. They operate differently, but it's incumbent upon us to make sure we have the plan for our principal see the big picture. And that was the discussion that I was so pleased with of our community superintendents and executive directors walking our principals through, okay, so this is what Dr. Williams said, but let's, let's now see what does that play out in a schoolhouse? And what does that mean? And it gives, it, it's giving our leaders, I would say, some structure. No one can guess what the work is, is going to be. It's giving some structure. What we have to do is, is plan it out because some schools may need additional support, like Ms. Hinn said, that safe and supportive environment. And I hate to say this, but we not only have to look at a safe and supportive environment in a classroom, we got to look at offices as well. Because as you will know, you get groups of people together, sometimes, you know, it may not be as conducive for a work environment. And that's the responsibility of our leaders. So I appreciate these comments. And what I'll do, I'll uh, include a little bit of what was shared today so board members can see at our next meeting, just see that alignment of the strategic plan and how that will touch a school and what a school leader will probably need to think about as they're thinking about their work, whether it's a principal, assistant principal, whatever that leader is, they need to think about how that school will impact the strategic plan. Because in essence, every school has to have its share to help move the data. I can't just rely on 10 schools to help move our data. I gotta get all 175 school centers and programs moving in a positive direction. So I appreciate those, those comments. Again, it was so on point with what was being shared with our principals this morning. So thank you. Ms. Cause. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for that uh, commentary. Um, Ms. Rowe? Yeah, I just wanted to say I appreciate, Dr. Williams, what you just said, because I like the plan. It's a good plan as plans go, but always everything is in the execution of the plan. And I'm really interested in particular in things like third grade reading levels and those metrics that will lead to giving us indicators about how well students are actually doing. Because one of the things I've noticed about plans is sometimes you get this plan and then you start looking to know if the plan is working and you're told, well, it's going to take three years to figure out if the plan is working. And then by the time you figure out the plan's not working and you talk about the next plan that sounds a little bit like the first plan, you know, we really need to have ways of knowing if the plan is being successful before we have multiple cohorts or children in upper grades, not reading at a third grade level, having poor academic outcomes that we've lost. And th this seems like it's a cycle that keeps repeating itself. And I would really like to see, I'm looking forward to your implementation presentation because I would like to see how this is gonna play out and how when the rubber meets the road, we're not gonna let children just progress through the grades with um, falling behind each grade that they progress to the next.
Thank you. Um, duly noted, when we come back, um, one slide was shared about the, just the development and looking at certain grades um, that was raised earlier. Um, but to your point, it is all in the implementation uh, and the monitoring. It's why focus one is entitled learning accountability and results. Uh, and that was being very strategic that we want to make sure learning is happening. We all are accountable ultimately to get results. Um, but to your point, we, we, we're, right now we're talking about those kids who already had gaps even before this was pre-COVID-19. So knowing that our schools need to know who are those students and what are we doing differently to help build any skill set, um, help to accelerate any learning. Um, and so to your point, uh, duly noted about the implementation of any strategic plan, um, it's, it's all in, okay, so what are we doing and are students learning? If not, why not? And what are we going to do about it? Those are the, the key areas and questions um, that we constantly talk about uh, as a part of our my senior leadership team. And schools should be having those questions as well. And, and we're going we're gonna to be asking those questions. So uh, your point is well taken all about the implementation. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I wanted to offer my comments um, at this point. This is my fifth year on the Board of Education. Okay. There we are. Thank you. So, Dr. Williams, I wanted to make um, some brief comments. Um, let me be the first to uh, congratulate you on your almost one year anniversary. We won't be together on July 1st as a board, um, but um, that it was your first start date. And um, I want to say, having been on the board for five years, I knew that you were walking into a number of challenges in order to achieve the mission of equitable and excellent education for each child in Baltimore County Public Schools. And then we had the pandemic, which we are still persevering through. And then we had the economic crisis uh, in which we are um, oh, still, still going to be for some time. Um, so I appreciate your diligent work on the strategic plan um, and also in putting in to the strategic plan the piece where you go back and evaluate after you have um, implemented the plan and to uh, just dovetail with Ms. Rowe on this point. Um, it is about, as you've mentioned, structure, consistency, but then having that accountability piece and then the transparency of that accountability. Um, and I'm looking forward to your implementation um, of the strategic plan. I believe that there is tremendous progress that we can make. Right now we are in the pandemic and we've had to pivot and you and your staff and um, everyone throughout the school system and really in the communities have pivoted to a new type of work, a new type of teaching, a new type of learning, a new type of living. Um, and yes, we are going to plan for the fall potential uh, surge for the pandemic. And then, yes, we are planning for recovery from all the disruptions of um, the pandemic and also the limitations that we have seen on distance learning. But this pandemic will pass and then we will work through the recovery. And then this strategic plan will really see uh, the fruits of it um, as we really make improvements for our children. So one of the things that I would like to point out is um, we have policy 0100, which is under review right now, but it has, um, which is being expanded and strengthened. Um, and one of the things that policy 0100 speaks to is recruiting and increasing participation of persons from underrepresented groups in school programs and to report annually on the employment, retention, recruiting, and placement of persons from underrepresented groups. 
and the board has not received that report and we've discussed this and I appreciate your commitment to following through on that accountability because it is so important that we understand that. Also in terms of the supports of getting the children um, in the proper way to being prepared for education. And part of that is nutrition, but part of that is also transportation. We have not received a report um, regarding the baseline for on time arrivals for our school children. And we know how that important that is for them to get to school on time, um, but also many children need to get there on time in order to eat breakfast. So we look forward to your follow up in the strategic plan and all of the components, which um, really start, as you said, with the student in the center and then the schoolhouse and then all of the things that support the work there. So I just wanted to make those few points and um, appreciate your work. Other board members? Dr. Williams, you want to make any final comments on the strategic plan before we move forward? I would just like to, to thank Dr. Wheatley Phillip, Dr. Cole, Mr. Connolly, the community superintendents, executive directors, and all the staff in, in uh, DRAW. Again, um, this was a very collaborative effort, um, and, and I'm so appreciative of the many hours that they spent and the many questions that they answered from me. Um, and again, um, I look forward to actually implementing this work. Um, you know, even though we've had some challenges with uh, closing schools and offices, I do look forward that we are trying to make a difference for all students and close gaps. So I just want to thank the staff and uh, appreciate the comments from the board. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda is uh, board member comments. And so I will just have board members make their comments as we go around the room. And if we can start with um, Mr. Kuhn. Excuse me, you, um, one moment, Mr. Kuhn. Also at this time, um, it will be uh, committee updates along with uh, your comments. So, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, thank you, Ms. Causey. Uh, thank you, Dr. Williams, for um, sharing your one pager with us. Appreciate that. I just want to take a moment uh, since school literally ended on Friday officially and congratulate everybody um, from students to teachers to coaches to bus drivers, to everybody involved, thank you very much. Uh, we made it through a trying year and <clears throat> we're already looking forward to entry uh, this coming September, um, this coming fall. Um, and I just want to uh, I wish everybody um, a, a restive um, summer and um, please take advantage of the materials <clears throat> and um, that, that are being made for summer school and enjoy your time uh, going forward. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Pasture. Thank you. Uh, I wanna uh, jump on what Mr. Kuhn just said. Um, everyone on staff and every school, everyone on the board, these have been very, very um, tough times to parents and the students. I am just, um, I am very proud of the resiliency and the commitment to making sure our children get the very best. And I wanna thank particularly um, Dr. McComas and her staff and all of those people who've had to uh, the support systems for them, Dr. Scriven with the food, but on such short notice, trying to put together a body of work that would keep our children 
together as um, as best as possible. And I know that they're working towards that summer program that will lead us into re-entry that is going to take into consideration all of those groups, all of those concerns that are listed in the um, equity um, um, 0100 uh, so that our children who have disabilities, who Esau, whatever, are going to feel included. And I want to just end the personal comment with a piece, a quote from one of my favorite poets, Nikki Giovanni. She says, we are strong enough to stand tall tearlessly. We are brave enough to bend to cry. And we are sad enough to know that we must laugh again. And we will. So I haven't said that. Ms. Causey, do you want, while you're with me, do you want to do committee reports now? Or are you going to come back around? What is your uh, let's go ahead and do... Um committee reports, if that's okay. Okay. Um, even though the legislative committee is not working, they is still meeting. So yesterday we did um, meet, and uh, John did go over uh, the successes. And I think it's important to know among them that this is a record high, he said, that this year there were 430 plus bills related to education. And I, I think that is uh, just, sorry, um, in, just in and of itself, it says that our state legislature is processing what's going on in our schools for our children. So we certainly wanna keep that going. Those of you who listened to the curriculum committee last week um, heard uh, Dr. Um, Adams and uh, Dr. McComas and Ms. Shea uh, start to unpack the summer program. And um, they are this week meeting with stakeholder groups talking about the reentry plan. So they are very much on that. Um, I want to, Ms. Causey, give um, Dr. Hager a moment because she has a point that she wanted to share uh, that comes, it's attached to the curriculum committee. So Dr. Hager, if you'll chime in, please. Um, sure, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Fesher. So um, I was actually going to mention in my comments too that now that summer has officially begun, my three children have already started the summer learning hike program, which we heard about in the curriculum committee meeting. And my kids seem to like it so far, but I have started to hear some early concerns about the rollout of the program, particularly for our non-English speaking families. And um, one thing after, soon after joining the board, I did uh, ask during a curriculum committee meeting how we would define the success of the summer, summer, learning, summer learning hike program. And I do believe that this program could hold promise for the future beyond just the summer. Um, but I do think it's going to be important for the curriculum committee and the equity committee to work with the county so that we really understand how the, the program is successful, but also what the challenges are to the program and for whom it's working best. And so now is the time as it's starting to roll out to really start understanding those uh, challenges and successes right off the bat. So um, we were excited to hear about the good things about the program last week, but I think we need to be very aware of any sorts of challenges that it experiences as it's rolled out. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Thank you. That's me, Ms. Walker. Thank you, Ms. Pesture. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Rashid? I have no comment. Thank you. Ms. Hen? Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'll begin by saying that 2020 certainly is a year that none of us will ever forget for both um, good ways and, and not so good ways. But I'd, I'd like to thank everyone on staff from Dr. Williams and his cabinet to our school-based teams and all of the support staff 
who jumped in and without asking and really without choice, did what it took to keep things moving and to keep keep us connected. So even though we were socially distanced, we were, I'm in a board meeting out. We were never alone, never apart. And that connectedness is so important, especially for our students. And what will stay with me long beyond this and after this is over is that sense of connectedness. And we, when we speak of BCPS as a family, that was never more apparent than it was during this time. So I'll close with some words for our students as you begin your summer break. These, this was some advice that I shared with one of our Perry Hall Middle School students who asked to interview me about the pandemic. And she asked, what would you like students to know during this time? And I think this applies towards your summer break as it did during the pandemic. Use this time to focus on what matters most to you, your family, your friends, your health, certainly, your pets, your service, your interests, your hobbies. Find your joy. Whatever brings you happiness, embrace it and make it your own. Learn everything you can about it and live it and tap into that happiness often. When you identify what matters, you'll know what doesn't matter. And if it isn't on your list, don't stress over it. You are enough. Don't listen to the voice that tells you otherwise. Accept and make peace with uncertainty. Answers will come in due time. We are all figuring this stuff out together. A lot of adults care about your success and we want what's best for you. Learn to love imperfection. You're human and so is everyone else. Be kind and be patient with yourself. You are in control, even though it may not feel like it. Use this time to supercharge your own learning and pursue an interest. Use your online resources, reach out to experts, and use your downtime, especially when we're all at home. There's never been a better time. And remember, this isn't going to last forever. Have a great summer, everyone. Be safe. Take care. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Thank you. Um, real quick, congratulations to all of the 2020 graduates. Um, I know the past weeks have been emotional and heartbreaking for a lot of us. So just hang in there. I also want to congratulate the principal of the year for Baltimore County Public Schools. And this is the last board meeting with our student member, Omar Rashid. Uh, you have done an excellent job. We're going to miss you. And good luck in college and keep in touch. Uh, what else? I think that's pretty much it. I also want to quickly touch upon, um, you know, the fact that it's been almost 60 years that Dr. King gave us his first speech, and yet we continue to see disparities, inequalities, and in inequities to this day. And I'm really heartened when I see the younger generation and their passion, including Omar and his friends uh, and the students, their call for justice. And that gives me a lot of hope because we continue to see the pain felt by generation and generation of black Americans in this country who have never felt equal. So to all those people that tell me I am tired of hearing about racism, imagine how tired the African-Americans must be experiencing racism for the past 400 years and the people of color in this country. We are tired too. So, you know, just saying Black Lives Matter, posting on social media, but not supporting those very policies, ideas, and politics doesn't mean anything. We need to realize our collective power and ask for change and demand it. Dismantle the very racist policies that have been put there in the first place. As, as, as members of the Board of Education, we have the power to do so in education. We should do that. We should dismantle the segregation that takes place in our schools. And um, for a fact, as an engineer, I look at facts. Fact is, we know that a child that goes to college has a 90% chance of getting out of poverty. That is a huge, I work with the city of Baltimore for youth work, a 90% chance that if we give these kids a good career, a good education, they will be out of poverty. That is a a life-changing event and we should all put our force behind us. I believe um, deep down all members of the board do want that. 
and we should work to us towards that along with Dr. Williams. So good night and take care. Mr. McMillian. Uh, thank you. These are my comments from last meeting where we didn't have the opportunity to share them. I want to congratulate all the principals of the year. Um, on a different note, I'm so happy to have had the opportunity to meet uh, Omar Rashid. Uh, he's a wonderful young man. In my 35 years of teaching school, every once in a while, you would meet a young man or a young woman like Omar. And I'm just so happy for him uh, as he, he moves on to college and he has the opportunity to, to go out into the world and make his mark. And I'm just I'm so pleased and I hope that he comes back and he shares with us you know, his endeavors and, and what he's into. Um, it was just, a, it's a very, very heartwarming experience for me to meet a young man like him. And I'm so happy I had that opportunity. So, and, and I hope everyone enjoys their summer um, a couple weeks off. I just hope everybody has a good time. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Yes, I have a brief message to Mr. Omar Rashid, our student member of the board and other 2020 graduates. Journalist and former TV anchor Tom Brokaw said, you are educated. Your certification is in your degree. You may think of it as the ticket to the good life. Let me ask you to think of an alternative. Think of it as your ticket to change the world. I would encourage you to heed Mr. Brokaw's words Use your degree to change the world. We are counting on you. Congratulations. That's it. Ms. Scott? Thank you for that. And again, I echo, I echo all of the congratulations to Omar Rashid um, and wish him um, much success in his future endeavors and as he heads off to college. Um, but I would like to take this time to use my board comments to acknowledge and appreciate all of the hard work um, that BCPS staff have done. I'd like to thank all staff at BCPS. Everyone has done a great job during these unprecedented times. Uh, and I, I just feel that that needs to be said. You have been asked to do things that you have not had to do before um, due to COVID-19, distant learning. There's really no playbook for how to teach, stu how to teach students or how to run a school system during a global, uh, global pandemic crisis. So I'd like to thank all of you, and no one in the particular following order, but I'd like to thank all of our school bus attendants, drivers, all transportation staff, central office staff and administration, front office staff, cafeteria and food service staff, custodial staff, building service workers, grounds workers, maintenance workers, engineering and construction employees, logistic workers, environmental service employees, safety and security employees, principals, all of our principals and assistant principals, all of our teachers, all of our paraprofessionals, department chairs, school counselors, psychologists, social workers, school nurses, pupil personnel workers, occupational and physical therapists, speech language pathologists, library media specialists, central office staff, substitute teachers, nurses, afternoon, evening, Saturday, alternative educators, home and hospital staff, curriculum writers, summer school teachers, and summer school nurses. Thank you for everything and every one of you for all that you've done for all of BCPS students, parents, teachers, and I'd like to personally thank you for all of the support that you've given um, to the board because without the support of staff, Without the important work that you all do every day, we as a board would not be here. So thank you for everything that you've done in these most unprecedented times. And um, Kathleen, would you like me now also to give my um, committee update as well for the equity committee? Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so the equity committee was created to ensure that we at BCPS and the board are working to create a safe caring and mutually respectful environment within our school system and district so that all students, family and staff feel welcomed, valued and supported at BCPS. So the equity 
um, committee had its first meeting, uh, June 17th, where we met to discuss future meeting dates, the mission of the equity committee, as well as the planning and ideas around the proposed equity audit. Uh, important things that we need to look at now, as well as future planning based on the current COVID-19 pandemic, as well as understanding the implications of the digital divide on BCPS students, what that means now, what that will mean for the future. Additionally, we had a robust discussion on all of the above areas and explored ways that we can ensure that BCPS continues to make sure that we're providing equitable solutions for all of our students. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Ms. Scott. Ms. Rowe? Thank you, Ms. Kavi. Uh, I, I thought my mic was muted early, but now the whole world, you heard me reprimand my children. Um, this is a very unusual year with the pandemic, and we've had no road of this. And I wanted to congratulate our graduates and um, congratulate our parents for living through having to work at home and also, I their children and children studying and keep their children motivated to keep working and remind people that there are varying degrees of success in which that also varying degrees in which different families face hardships and obstacles place. And I believe that need to make sure that we remember to have a little bit of grace with one another and grace with our teachers and our school system and grace with our children as we go into this summer and do some summer learning but you know take breaks and have fun as well so um congratulations to graduates and uh, i look forward to next fall and whatever that brings because we don't really know um for committee update i'm now chair of the audit committee and uh, we had a meeting which was the first meeting that i chaired and we went through an orientation of audit committee and um what our policies say what the audit committee is it was very informative Ms. barr was very helpful in answering questions as was uh, mr nesbaum and we approved the work plan and we went over various ways where we'll have more communication with board members in the weekly update and ways that we can communicate with the public without um, revealing confidential information because the work that the audit uh, office of internal audit does is important it's the accountability arm of the school system and people need to know that uh, things are being held accountable so um, that's really all I have for that. Thank you, Ms. Kazi. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Dr. Hager. Um, thank you. Um, I just had two other things I wanted to mention. First, I wanted to thank Dr. Williams for focusing on educational equity at the center of his strategic plan. I'm really excited to work with Ms. Scott and the other board members on the newly formed equity committee that you just heard about. And I'm truly optimistic that with the combined dedication of the school board and the school system that we can work together to reduce educational disparities in Baltimore County schools, which was a big reason that I wanted to get on the school board in the first place. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about uh, the plans for the future. And then finally, I wanted to congratulate all the BCPS graduates, including Mr. Rashid, whom I've never actually met in person, but maybe one day our paths will cross in person. And I want to give an extra congratulations to those first. So the students that are the first or one of the first in their families to graduate from high school or those who are the first or one of the first to go on to college. So I'm really ex extra excited for those students and I'm really proud of all the accomplishments of our students and want to wish everyone congratulations. And that's it. Thank you. I'm going to give an update on the policy review committee uh, being the chair of that committee. Uh, our last committee was held virtually on June 17th. Um, the minutes of the committee meeting are available for viewing on the school system's website, bcps.org. Um, you can read the summary or you can also watch the video of the meeting. 
During the 1920 school year, the Policy Review Committee amended, discussed, or reviewed 30 policies. Uh, the committee's uh, approved meeting schedule for the 2021 school year will be available on the school's webpage. Um, the first meeting of PRC is currently scheduled for September 21st, keeping in mind that this date may change based on the determination of when to reopen schools and um, other issues related to uh, safety in Maryland given the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, at the June 17th, 20 um, meeting, we did review policy 0100 equity, um, and it's been um, added to. Um, there's a lot of robust revisions in there. Uh, we appreciate the work of Maryland Association Boards of Education and the Maryland State Department of Education uh, with their focus on um, excellence and equity in education that helped guide our work. That policy 0100 draft is coming forward to the full board on July 14th uh, in what's known as first reader, where board members will be able to comment, have discussion, and also um, then the community may uh, offer uh, public comment on it also. There's special places on the website where they can do that or they can email the board at boe at bcps.org. Um, we also discussed other concerns of the community, uh, which uh, the Board, when we hear different situations, we'll discuss with the superintendent and then decide if he's going to handle it or if there's sometimes there's areas in policy um, so that we were able to discuss concerns and um, that was very helpful. Then for uh, my comments, I, again, I just wanted to wish Dr. Williams a happy first anniversary on July 1st. Uh, wanted to wish Omar well um, as he moves on to a very bright future um, and thank him for all of his work uh, this past year. I also want to say congratulations again to all of the 2020 graduates. Um, the virtual graduations were so inspiring to see the seniors and their remarks. It, and even though it was virtual, it was just um, wonderful to see the principals and the teachers um, and their positive relationship with their students. I encourage everyone to go to bcps.org and watch those graduation ceremonies. Any one of them will bolster your hope in our future because of these students and what emerging leaders they are. I also wanted to say that um, this summer is a time for people to rest, connect with nature and families in different ways. Um, but I do also want to encourage folks, take a break, but also to check the summer learning hikes because we know that uh, the children did not receive the benefit of that individual instruction in the schoolhouse with their teachers so that it will be helpful to try and reinforce um, over the summer. So I hope everyone will check in and do that. And um, there, I just echo the comments of my board members and I appreciate all of your work this school year. Um, it was different than we expected, but everyone rose to the occasion and I am optimistic for the future, uh, the positive impact that we're gonna be able to have for the children of Baltimore County. That concludes board member comments and committee updates. The next item on the agenda is item M, information. And we have on attached to the board docs is the revised superintendent's rule 5552, students conduct use of personal electronic communication devices by students. And the last item on the agenda for this evening is announcements. The next board meeting is going to be Tuesday, July 14th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. and it will be a virtual board meeting. Dr. Williams, do you want to say anything uh, before I end the meeting? No additional comment. This thank you all for tonight. And, and again, once again, I just want to acknowledge the staff and um, Ms. Stifler who is there uh, filling in for Ms. Gober. So I thank the staff, Mr. Corns as well, I believe. I just want to thank all those who are, are present and uh, appreciate the support, particularly when we had to take a recess because my power went out or something happened. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. We just need to roll with it and persevere. Um, so everyone just continue to take care of yourself take care of each other and 
Uh, have a great, uh, relaxing summer. Take care. The meeting is now adjourned.